On to the next game, Poppin' Twinby. This game was released in 1993 for the Super Famicom, but it also got an English release later that year in Europe. Didn't make it over to North America, though. Huh. Regardless, these days you can play the English version through Nintendo Switch Online, and if you're worried about the fact that it's a European game, don't be. Nintendo went out of their way to alter the ROM so that it runs at 60Hz, so it plays as smoothly as the Japanese version. Now this game's story is definitely the stupidest one yet, but it's clearly deliberately stupid, so let's give it a round of applause for that. Light and Pastel are patrolling around Donbudi Island when they receive a transmission from a girl named Madoka. She tells them that her grandfather, Dr. Mardok, a kind but clumsy scientist, hit his head on a pole. This accident turned him evil, so he decides to take over the world! By the way, does anyone think he looks like a cross between Dr. Eggman and Dr. Wily? So this game is largely similar to Detona, but the biggest difference is that instead of lives, you have a life meter. So that's why this game was left out in North America. It was because of Konami USA's immense hatred of life meters at the time. You know, it's also why they took the life meter out of the American version of Contra Hardcore. You could also hold down the shoot button this time, effectively eliminating the risk of hand cramps. This unfortunately means that the charge shot is gone, but in its place comes a new ability, the Chibi Blaster. By pressing the A button, you can unleash multiple mini ships that bounce around all over the place, wiping out everything in their path. The bells have gone under a minor revamp in this game. Blue bells still speed up your ship, red bells still give you a barrier, and green bells still give you mini ships for extra firepower, though now you only get one per green bell. What's changed is the white bell, which instead of giving you a double shot, instead just gives you a larger shot. Doesn't really do any more damage than the normal shot, though. You're honestly best ignoring this in favor of the purple bell, which now gives you a spread shot, which is much more helpful. There's also the flashing bell, which grants you another chibi blaster. Try to get as many of these as possible and hold onto them for as long as you can, because this game, while not as hard as Detona, can sneak up on you. Especially late game, where the amount of shit you're expected to dodge can get pretty aggressive. Difficulty is scaled on a meter between 1 and 7, with 7 being the hardest, but even the easier difficulties can be pretty challenging, especially if you're new to shmups. You don't have lives in this game, so when your life meter runs out, you'll have to start the whole stage over, and you only get seven continues. Let those run out, and it's back to the title screen. Thankfully, bombing grounded enemies will occasionally let you pick up more health, so be sure to do that as often as you can. Hey, what the fuck? Those pineapples were just out for a stroll! There wasn't any need to bomb them like that! Aw, look at the cute little parachuters! <laughs> Holy shit. Pop and Twinbee isn't quite as colorful as Detona, considering we're on the SNES rather than an arcade cabinet, but it's still a very pretty game, and thankfully this time around, bullets are a lot easier to see, making them easier to dodge. The bosses are a little quirkier than last time, though not especially so. I don't think any boss in this series will get as weird as the ones from Twinbee 3, to be honest. I love this cute little bonbon pirates you fight in the first stage, they're so adorable! I almost feel bad for burning them to a crisp. I also like this guy who thinks that the structure of the boss you think is going to get easier as it progresses since you're destroying all of his weapons, but then out comes this very erratic blaster attack that took me by surprise. The final boss also caught me off guard because I wasn't expecting his laser attack to have vacuum properties to it, and I ended up dying and having to restart the level because I wasn't prepared for it. Poppin' Twimby is a really fun game that I personally consider to be the high point of the series so far. It's definitely one of my favorites, but can we call it my absolute favorite? Hard to say. I mean, for all I know, I only like it because of its fucking amazing commercial. There's still a few more games to look at. Let's take a look at the Game Boy version of this game, because as a handheld version of a console game, it's bound to be the superior version. Alright, so that sarcastic remark was my first thought going in, but then as I started the game, something seemed off. This looks like Twinbee 1. A lot like Twinbee 1. Same music, same background, same power-ups, and since the Game Boy has no color, they rely on different shades to tell you what power-ups the bell will give you, and while it's easier to read them than I expected it to be, the lack of color still makes it a little challenging. And the grounded enemies in the background are a little difficult to notice for similar reasons. Still, though, this isn't Poppin' Twinby at all. The first stage feels a lot like Twinby 1, but this is still very much its own game. So why does it share a name with Poppin' Twinby on the SNES? I mean, while usually inferior, handheld versions of console games still typically share a semblance of similarity with their console counterparts. Usually. But what's the deal with this game? 
I was actually so confused about this that I went to the wiki to get more information on this game, and it turns out that not only is this a different game entirely, it actually predates Poppin' Twinby as well as Detona in Japan, and is intended as a direct follow-up to Twinby 2 and 3, meaning we're actually playing as Squash. Not only that, but in Japan it goes under a different name entirely. Yeah, it turns out this game is actually called Twinby Da, but that name just makes me think of Puyo Puyo Da. Man, that game was a weird one. Basically what I'm getting from this is that when bringing this game over to Europe, Konami decided to give it the Poppin' Twinbee name. I'm guessing out of a desire to hype it up as the same game being available in the Game Boy. Problem is, by doing that, even if it was Poppin', you're creating expectations that can't possibly be met. What bugs me most of all, though, would definitely be the box art. This is just the same box art as Poppin', but the game has different characters entirely. Now that's just downright misleading, though. To be fair, you only ever see the ship in the game. Well, if there's any bright side to this, it's that I can judge it as its own thing rather than an inferior Game Boy port of Poppin'. Anyway, this story is the simplest one yet. Squash and Whip receive a challenge from one Dr. Nikki, who I can't show a picture of because he doesn't have one. That's right, this guy is never seen at all. Apparently he's mad because they destroyed Gatlantis and the Aimless Demon King in addition to King Spice, but that just means that like Dr. Cinnamon, he'd be well over 100 years old. Do people just not die here or something? Now I'd like to go deeper into gameplay, but there isn't really a lot to say about this one. It doesn't really do anything that the other three games didn't do already, though I guess I can give it props for being a solid Game Boy game, and apparently you can use the Game Boy Link cable to play with two players, but there's no way I'm going to be able to show off footage for that. The bosses are all original, but there's not really enough to them to go into detail. The only thing I can really remember, even right after I finished the game, was this guy for marking the difficulty spike. Yeah, they're weird looking, but they're not so weird that I can even think of a joke to make about them. Damn it, I died. Wait, wait a minute, wait, is that- YES! You can get your power-ups back just like in Twimby 3! Thank you! Alright, there's the detail I had to mention. Twimby Da isn't a bad game at all, but aside from portability, there isn't really a reason to play this over Twimby 3, Detona, and especially Poppin'. Oh well, on to the next game. Next up is Twimby Rainbow Bell Adventure. This one was also released in Europe under the name of Poppin' Twimby Rainbow Bell Adventures. Man, Konami Europe must have really wanted to push Poppin' as part of the series branding over there because this game is very much its own thing. I guess this could excuse the English name of Twimby Da, but it definitely does not excuse the boxer. I will not let this go. So Twimby Rainbow Bell Adventure is a completely different game from any of its predecessors, by which I mean it's a different genre entirely. Yeah, we're in a 2D platformer of all things. So, is this game well designed despite the total genre shift, or is this some Kensuke Tanabe shit that's just different for the sake of being different? So anyway, the game starts off by making me think the Star Wars theme is gonna start playing. Holy shit, it's so similar! Is Disney gonna sue Konami for this? Are they gonna sue me for showing this? That doesn't sound good. Anyway, the story is that the seven rainbow bells that bring peace and harmony to the galaxy have been stolen by Dr. Wily, I mean, Wadumon. Light Pastel and this time Mint travel across the galaxy to get them back and put Wadumon in his place. Throughout the adventure, the three will interact with Dr. Cinnamon and occasionally Dr. Wadumon about the locations they're traveling to. This can range between minor tips to help you throughout the game as well as comedy-driven conversations that can get a little on the weird side at times. Excuse me? These cutscenes are really charming and are sure to make the adventure a lot more enjoyable. Assuming you're not playing the European version, but more on that later. Now the main thing that separates Rainbow Bell Adventure from other platformers is its unique method of incorporating shmup elements into its gameplay. You can collect a wide variety of power-ups that can be stacked to really deck yourself out, and by holding down the jump button and letting go while pressing the D-pad in any direction, you can fly. It's not as free as the flight in, say, Kirby, as you move in a straight line and ricochet off walls until you lose momentum, but you can get some serious airtime with this ability, especially as Pastel. Actually, let's get into the characters. So at the very start, you can choose between Light, Pastel, and Mint, who's actually playable this time around instead of just a power-up. They each have their own strengths and weaknesses, and the only way to switch between them is to either die or pause and enter the Konami code, so changing characters is a little annoying. Anyway, Light is an all-around character with nothing particularly special about him. Pastel's jump meter is notably smaller, allowing her to fly more easily, but her power meter is much longer, so she can't charge an attack as fast. Mint is the opposite from Pastel in that it takes a while to start flying, but his charge attack charges really fast, allowing him to make sure work of bosses. Power-ups are obtained by defeating enemies and range from a laser for ranged attacks, a shield to protect yourself from taking damage once, a tail shield which isn't too useful outside of bosses but can attack enemies on contact, cleats for stable control on ice, invincibility, and a special weapon depending on the character. Light gets a hammer to squash enemies in his path, Pastel gets a whip she can use to attack in four directions, and mid- wait, hang on a second. Squash. Whip. Oh, I get it. Wait, what do pacifiers have to do with the word mellow? Is that another word for them or is the reference dead? 
Oh, right, Mink gets pacifiers that act as projectiles, which can be fired in four directions. I think my favorite of the three is probably Pastel. Her short jump meter gives her great mobility, and her whip is really effective. I also enjoy using Mint for bosses, though. Now, all of these abilities might make this game sound pretty easy, but it's still no walk in the park. The level design can get a little challenging at times, especially since you only have one life. You can only afford to get hit three times without a shield, but you can heal either by finding hearts on the stage or by grabbing 100 bells. Run out of health once and it's game over. Thankfully, the game saves every time you beat a level or collect a hidden item, but it can get a little annoying after you die a few times in the same stage. The bosses can also be pretty challenging. Much like a shmup, beating these guys requires a lot of patience and memorization of their patterns. None of them feel unfair, but the difficulty of them can sneak up on you. Try going into an easier stage to grab a bunch of power-ups before starting the fight if it's giving you a hard time. This guy in particular can kiss my ass, though. Every time you hit him, some pieces come flying out, and you have to dodge those while also keeping track of his movements. Developing an attack pattern to reliably beat him took some time because of this. Alright, I beat the level. Hang on, what's this? Target time? That's so short! Is it really possible to beat the level that fast? Well, let's give it a try. Yes! I did it! Wow, the game's really fucking happy about it too, as if it didn't expect me to actually pull it off. Wow, you know, I actually really feel like I accomplished something because of this. Thanks, game! Now, unlike many platformers, this game isn't really very linear in design. It's kind of like Super Mario World in that the levels have multiple exits that decide where you go next. This extends to the levels themselves, too. Just because you're at the start doesn't mean you have to go right. There's all kinds of things to look out for in the levels, such as these little fairies hidden around, alternate exits, and these doors which can only be opened when you find a key of matching color. Your ending will change depending on how much you've done, and there's a lot to do here. I managed to find every single exit in the game, played every level, beat all the bosses, and I still only completed 38% of the game and ended up with the worst ending. I only needed 2% more to get a better one, too. Of course, all of this only applies if you're playing the Japanese version of the game, because the European version made some changes that I'm really not a fan of. For one, all of the dialogue throughout the game has been cut, removing a lot of the charm in the process, and the levels are now completely linear in layout, meaning the exploration factor has been downplayed considerably. There's also only one ending too, so add that to the list of reasons I don't like this version. If you're going to play this game, I would highly recommend playing the fan translation by Aeon Genesis. Hey, that's a familiar name, he also translated the Mata Monogatari game I played last time. Huh, that's the second time I brought up Puyo Puyo in this video. Anyway, before we move on, I also wanted to mention the presentation, because it's great. Backgrounds are pretty, everything is animated well, and the different locations all have their own identity. From a snowy mountain, to a maze-like cave, to a forest surrounded water- HOLY SHIT, DID THAT GUY JUST DROWN?! The soundtrack is also great, several themes are very catchy and memorable, and it just sounds super bouncy and fun. Twinbee Rainbow Bell Adventure is a fun but challenging platformer that I highly recommend checking out, it encourages fast, frantic gameplay as well as tons of exploration without letting the two clash with each other, and as a Sonic fan, I really love that. I really like to just play through a level casually, then go back to see what kind of stuff I can find if I look around. Definitely play this one, just make sure you're not playing the European version. Alright, if that last game seemed like a strange turn, then oh boy, get ready for this one. The next game on the list is Twinbee Tyson Puzzle Dama for the PS1. That's right, a puzzle game. Alright, so this is more of a side game, so I won't spend too much time on it. Basically, this game is a Twinbee-themed version of Konami's Tyson Puzzle Dama series. Despite that, it actually had a story, albeit a really inconsequential one. Basically, everyone decides to have a puzzle tournament, and the winner is granted one wish. That's it. Puyo Puyo 15th Anniversary would later go on to have the exact same plot. Speaking of Puyo, this game isn't really too different than it, with the only real difference being that you only have to match three of one color instead of four, and garbage requiring an additional step to clear. Okay, this is the third goddamn time I've brought up Puyo in this video. I swear I'm not doing this on purpose. Guess I just can't fucking escape this series. But anyway, yeah, it's a real simple game to understand. Just group up three of one color, try to make chains as best you can, and watch your opponent get buried in garbage. <laughs> Jesus, Pastel, calm down, you're fine. It wasn't that much garbage, and look, you won. Also, Dr. Cinnamon's just really happy to be here. Okay, let's move on to an actual shmup. Next on our list is Twinbee Yaho. This game was released on arcades in 1995, and later in the same year for Sega Saturn and PS1. I'll be looking at the Saturn version, because whenever an arcade game is ported to home console, you always pick the Sega version. Alright, so first off, can I just say that I love this stupid-ass walking logo? This is what you'd see on Japanese Konami games released on Saturn and PS1. Very different from what we got, but it's so adorable! Now imagine seeing it paired with something like Castlevania Symphony of the Night or Silent Hill. I think the sudden shift in tone would be pretty funny. So Twimmy Yahoo's story is actually a lot more involved than any of its predecessors. 
This game takes advantage of the more powerful hardware to have brief voice-acted segments of dialogue so you can see the story progress as you play as well as a short animated opening with a nice little vocal song playing. In 1995, this was probably really cool, but it hardly matters because unlike everything I've covered up to this point, this game doesn't have a translation. Not even a fan translation, though. Thanks to dedicated fans of the Twinby Wiki, I was able to find a synopsis as well as a translated script of the game. Thanks, guys. Light and Pastel come across a fairy named Flute who tells them that her home known as Wonderland has been taken over by the evil Archduke Nonsense! Flute asks the two for help to save Wonderland and its ruler, Queen Melody, who is currently imprisoned. As they travel through Wonderland, they discover that the real mastermind behind the whole scheme is none other than Dr. Wile- I mean, Wadumon. Damn it, I did it again! Anyway, they chase down Dr. Wadumon, rescue the Queen, and save Wonderland. Not a super deep plot, but it's clear they at least wanted you to pay a little attention, and for a shmup, that's pretty nice. Hey, now is not the time to be fishing! So as soon as you start the game, you may notice just how gorgeous this game looks like. God damn, this is a good looking game. The backgrounds are colorful, well animated, and have a lot of depth to them, like in this sequence where your ship loops around, and this one where you swerve to the sides. The bullets look a lot like the ones in Detonet, which I complained about there, but I find them a little easier to deal with in this game, though I couldn't tell you why. The soundtrack is also great, just about every stage theme sounds so upbeat and happy. I think stage 2 is probably my favorite. Really, between this game, Rainbow Bell Adventure, and Twin B3, I'm not sure which is my favorite, but they're all wonderful. As for the game itself, it's a lot like Detona, though it has a difficulty slider more like Poppin'. You can adjust your shot type and also select whether or not your shot and bomb are set to the same button, just like in the English version of Detona, so there's plenty of options depending on what kind of player you are. Bells work the same as in Detona, so there isn't much to explain there, though the tail shield and drones have been consolidated into a single power-up, just like the previous games. Some of the levels have additional horizontal scrolling, which threw me off at first, but it was nice to have additional room for dodging attacks. This game goes back to being downright bizarre, just like the NES games, but not quite to the level of Twin B3. We've got the kitchen utensil enemies back, though, and the bosses are especially on the weirder side again. Start off fighting Mary Poppins' boxing mech, there's these big guys who dance around while throwing yoga balls at you, and whoa, forget creepy dolls from horror movies. These days, it's all about creepy doll-themed giant robots that shoot lasers from their eyes. Twimby Yahoo definitely knows how to leave an impression on the player, and it's also the easiest game in the series by far, so I don't think it would hurt to start with this one if you're just getting into the series. I sure had a lot of fun with it. I think I like popping a little more, but Yahoo's a super close second. Alright, so last but not least is Twimby RPG. This game was released in 1998 for the PS1. It was made for fans of the radio show who weren't very good at shmups, and what better game to tackle than an RPG? Going from a shooting game to an RPG may sound kind of strange, but hey, Panzer Dragoon did the same thing, and fans of that series love that game. Yeah, it cost $3,000, but still! Okay, so going into this, I encountered a very major obstacle. This game has not been translated. My extremely limited knowledge of the Japanese language helped me in a couple places, mostly with just navigating menus, but I'm not anywhere close to fluent, so playing an RPG is pretty much impossible. But for the sake of this video, I made a little progress. I also wasn't able to save the game, I suspect because I have an American memory card. The game starts with Light, Pastel, and Mint fighting Dr. Watamon once again. Suddenly, the screen gets all staticky and Princess Melora appears and tells you to help her with something, probably save the world given the fact that it's the beginning of a video game, but I'm not sure. I also want to mention that you can refuse to help her and the game just resets. Hey, I mean, if you don't want to play the game, it's not like anyone's gonna make you. Anyway, you give her your name, agree to help, and suddenly this happens. Whoa! Where am I? Alright, so you're dropped into this temple on Donburi Island in the body of this 13-year-old kid, and the moment you walk out, these two archaeologist-looking guys speak to you. I'm not sure what their deal is, I'm not even sure what I'm saying to them, but you walk away and then they suddenly laugh at you for some reason. <laughs> hey, don't be rude! So after that, this mysterious fog rolls in and they just drop. <laughs> well, I guess that's what you get for laughing at me. Eventually you run into an unconscious twin bee, crawl inside him and give him a real surprise. Then it takes you back to Dr. Cinnamon's lab. Woo! Look at him go! Twimby explains what happens, though the only thing I really grasp from it is that the fog attacked them. Twimby heads outside with the kid, they do a few battles, and this is where I stopped playing. The battles seem a little on the simplistic side, but that may just be because it's the beginning of the game. Either way though, I had no idea where I was supposed to go, so I decided to call it a day. After all that, there's only one thing I can really say, and it's that looking at the character models, in addition to what I got from the battle system, I think it's a safe bet that whoever was in charge of this game had just played Final Fantasy VII. I don't know, the general style of the models reminds me a lot of it in particular, but there's also the weight meter that Square had been using for quite some time at that point. It also kind of reminds me of Kirby 64 as well, probably because of how colorful and cartoony it is more than anything else. I'm sorry, I wish I could say more about the game, but the language barrier was just too strong. 
tell you what, if this game ever gets a fan translation, I'll dedicate a video to it so I can give it a proper look. Who knows, maybe this is some hidden gem or at least an entertaining side trip. It certainly doesn't look like it was pushing the PlayStation to its limit, especially considering it's only one disc long, but I can't really judge it unless it either gets translated or I learn Japanese. Either way though, this game did not do very well in terms of sales. Whether it was overshadowed by larger titles or if interest in Twinbee was dying out, I couldn't tell you, but this game did so poorly that it ended up being the last game in the series. Every now and then there was a smaller game released for cell phones, like this game where you play rock, paper, scissors with pastel, this mahjong game, or a goddamn pachinko machine. Pastel also found herself appearing in some Konami games like Battle Trist and Konami Crazy Racers, but Twinby was pretty much dead at this point. The only real notable release afterwards was Twinby Portable for the PSP. This is a collection of every arcade Twinby game, but it also has Poppin' Twinby as well as a full-on remake of Twinby Da. This is really cool. The remake is just a nice graphical overhaul and not much else, but that alone makes it the best way to play this game. Problem is that you have to own a handheld no one gives a shit about, but at least it's region free and no language barriers are gonna keep you from enjoying this. I'd really like to see Twinby make a revival one of these days, but I don't see it happening. The shmup genre being a lot less popular than it used to be is one thing, but the real hurdle is Konami themselves. If you're a fan of any of their works, be it Castlevania, Silent Hill, or especially Metal Gear, I'm sure you know all too well what I'm talking about, and I doubt it'll get any better from here. But don't let any of that stop you from trying out the Twinby series. I seriously recommend checking them out if you're a shmup fan. Thank you all for watching, everyone. Until next time, this is Smash the Oni signing off.